Thanks for coming this morning. So we're going to go through physics radiation, brief history, um, talk about radiation risks to both patients and to us as surgeons, primarily looking at it from an endourology perspective, and then basic methods for radiation safety in the OR and new techniques uh, to reduce exposure. Does anyone know what this is? Close. Could be. Could be. It's an x-ray tube. So that's sort of the basis of what we're talking about today. So radiation is energy released in the form of particles or waves. Radiation can come in the form of ionizing radiation or non-ionizing. Ionizing radiation just has enough energy to displace electrons around an atom or molecule. The types of radiation you can see in the diagram on the right, uh, we're going to be dealing with x-ray radiation. Now the term x-ray was just used as the mathematical X. It was an unknown at the time it was discovered, and the name X stuck. So they didn't really come up with anything new for it. Uh, the electromagnetic spectrum looks at all types of radiation. Obviously, we're used to the visible spectrum. But as you move to the right side of the diagram, you get into ionizing radiation. And if you look at Planck's equation, the energy of photons or particles is equal to a constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength. So as you decrease wavelength moving to the right of the screen, you increase energy. So things like x-rays, gamma rays, cosmic rays are all ionizing radiation because they have the ability to displace electrons. So there are three different doses that they talk about uh, in radiation. The absorbed dose is just generally the amount of radiation or amount of energy deposited in a certain mass. Units are now grays, used to be uh, rads or radiation absorbed dose. Moving on from there, you have equivalent dose, which is the weighted dose or the absorbed dose um, times a weighting factor for the type of radiation involved. The weighting factor for x rays and gamma rays is just one. And then finally, effective dose, which is what we'll see a fair bit of today, is the total impact of radiation on the body based on tissue sensitivity. So every organ in the body has a different way that it responds to radiation. So you take the sum of all the equivalent doses to individual organs, put those all together, and you get the effective dose. Uh, the units there are sieverts. Uh, so most which ones do they report? So usually, sometimes you'll see uh, it in grades, you'll see just a general absorbed dose, but then for more specifics, it'll be Siebert. So most of the papers that I looked at were reporting in effective doses. So basics, uh, the x-ray tube. Nice little diagram here. You take electrical energy and you convert it into heat in the cathode, which is seen at the bottom right of the image. Electrons get released through the vacuum tube and they contact the anode, which is typically a tungsten, um, some, some sort of metal. They displace electrons and as electrons um, reshift and drop into different orbits, you get release of photons, which are your x-rays. Um, this is obviously surrounded by a lead cylinder or some sort of lead protective device. And then the x-rays get released down the bottom out of a small tube a small window. CT scan is just x-ray in three dimensions or a spinning x-ray, so it's a motorized rotating x-ray source. You have a narrow beam of x-rays that are released, but as it rotates, you're able to uh, send a signal to the computer to generate a 2D slice, and then those 2D slices are reformatted and reconstructed into the 3D images that we see. How much data is there? How much is the, like what's you know what I don't that's a good question I don't know that I'm not sure I can take a look uh, in, I don't know just because we we've been actually playing around with some software but we uh, if you download it in the DICOM format which is like the raw raw right then you can put it into various uh, software. It depends, of course, on how many slices there are. It's got a CTKD um, for just plain stones is between one to three cuts, and there's only about 260 images. If you're doing one for cancer, because they're running three times, and it's a much finer cut, you jack out to the energy. Um, so CTKD calls it the 
guys, but those two people, two to ten thousand. And then finally, fluoroscopy. Uh, you have an x-ray tube typically for our C arms that we use here. X-ray tube is at the bottom. Uh, it converts your electrical en energy into x-rays. And then it goes through filters. And with the filters, you can change, you can increase or decrease the image intensity. Then you go through a collimator. And collimator just narrows the field or widens it out, uh, depending on what you need to see. And then above the patient is the image intensifier that takes the x-rays and converts it into something that we can translate onto a screen. Does anyone know what this picture is? First x-ray. That is Marie Curie. Sorry? It's not Marie Curie. A uh, few years afterwards, but it is. So William Wilhelm Rankin. Uh, in 1895, discovered the x-ray. He had been experimenting with the Crookes tube, and his first subject was actually his wife. So he got his wife to put her hand out, and he took an x-ray image, and the bulge on her fourth finger is her wedding ring. So that's what you see there. So that was the first x-ray on a human. Um, I'll show that later. <laughs> um, Within a year, there have been a thousand publications on x-rays. There were x-ray machines being installed all over the place um, throughout the UK and Europe. And in 1896, John McIntyre, he was a Scottish surgeon, or a Scottish, sorry, physician. He opened the first x-ray department. He correctly identified uh, renal calculus for the first time. And it was confirmed the location after they did open surgery to remove it. So it was confirmed that, in fact, the x-ray did pick it up where the stone was. In 1901, the first ureteric stent was inserted under x-ray guidance. In 1903, the first cystogram was performed, and it was done with air, and it was used to identify a bladder calculus. And then in 1906, uh, two surgeons <coughs> went and they said, okay, we need some, some way to see the upper tracts. And so they took colloidal silver, which showed up on x-ray images, they performed cystograms on themselves first, found that there were no complications, and so then they went and shot it up the ureters and performed the first retrograde pilogram. What they didn't realize that over the coming weeks to months and by the next sort of 10 years later, nobody would be using colloidal silver because there was um, a number of reports that came out with renal infarcts, parenchymal necrosis, and the number of deaths that came from this. There was hematogenous dissemination of the silver. So that fell out of favor fairly quickly. In 1923 at the Mayo Clinic, uh, Dr. Osborne, who was a syphilologist, uh, which was a thing at the time, uh, he found that his patients who were being treated with high doses of sodium iodide, um, their bladders would light up on x-ray. And that was the first sort of start to <coughs> IV urography. Ultrasound didn't come in until 1940s, though getting into urology was a little bit later than that. And then finally in 1972, Hounsfield and Cormac invented the CT scan. And obviously things have changed significantly as a result of that discovery. Okay. Anybody know what this is? This is, I think... That's a thing for deciding if... That is correct. <laughs> this is called the shoot. <laughs> so this is a shoe fitting fluoroscope. This was used from the 1920s to the 1960s in all sort of high end shoe stores, particularly for children. Um, the two tubes, the two larger viewing ports you see, one was for the salesman, one for the parent, and then a smaller viewing tube was for the kids. So they'd go, they'd put their feet in there, and they would actually take an X-ray image that you can see right here of how well the shoe fit. Um, this was like high sophistication of the time. What they didn't realize was that the dose that was being given to the child was around 130 millisieverts, which when you think about a CT scan, a typical CT scan is somewhere between six or so, four to six for a CT KUB, up to maybe 16, for a CT IVP, and they were getting 130. They'd shoot this for about a hundred for 20 seconds at a time to get a good image, and they tell the parents, "Yeah, your kids' shoes they fit, so you should buy them." Uh, that fell out of favor. But thank you, Doctor Sullivan.
<laughs> there were a couple of publications that I looked at from the New England Journal in 1949 that were talking about the risks involved with this shoe fitting fluoroscope and maybe it shouldn't be included uh, in a typical shoe store. Anybody know what this picture is? Yeah, so this is the atomic bomb from Hiroshima, uh, dropped in August, August 6, 1945, and um, obviously controversial, significant devastation, but what came from it is the longest running studies on radiation effects from both large dose as well as small dose over time. And so a lot of the data for radiation safety that we use comes from the two atomic bombs as well as from the Chernobyl power plant disaster. So something good, I guess, has come out of that. Basics, typical chest x-ray is only 0.1 millisieverts. So the shoe fitting fluoroscope, 130 millisieverts, chest x-ray 0.1. They talk about when you go on a flight across the country, across Canada, 0.02 millisieverts, so very low. And then living close to a nuclear power plant, also not very much of a risk, 0.001 millisieverts. In general, Everybody receives some dose of radiation every year from background radiation, whether from the ground, from the things you eat, and from the sun. Uh, U.S. average is around 3 millisieverts per year. We're fortunate we're below average for Canada, way down at the bottom at 1.25 millisieverts. So that's, it's related to how close we are to the ocean. But if you look at other places in B.C., Prince George, their background radiation is basically a CTKUB every year. Penticton is similar, and clear water tops the chart at 7.88, so like a, a CT abdo every year is what people in clear water get from background radiation. Radon. Radon. Oh, okay. this, this is just ground. This is just background, background radiation. Yeah. So if you went back, I mean, do, you, do you know what it would be like near Hiroshima? Or? So the doses, the typical doses, like right now, or I don't know right now, the typical doses that people had at the time were often over 100 millisieverts. Um, though some, um, and a lot of the studies that base their data off Hiroshima, um, is as you got further and further away from the epicenter, your doses got down below 100 millisieverts at that time. But I don't know current doses. Basics. In the U.S., for background radiation, it's about 50% of total radiation. The rest of it is made up by us performing tests, for the most part. Um, this is from the International Atomic Energy Agency website. Just some basic doses for urological procedures. I was able to get uh, some information from one of our CT supervisors. An average CT KUB is somewhere between 1.5 to 4.5 millisievert. It's a CT abdo is increased three to nine in the CTIVP, obviously with multiple phases, up to 16.5 millisieverts per, uh, per CT scan. These numbers will start making a little more sense when we talk about um, the basics for us as urologists in radiation safety. So can you go back one comment? Yeah. I'd like to clarify that um, when we do a CT TV, uh, this is just the, the standard result in contrast, but if your BMI is well, for, they can't do it. So that that would, so, um, if your BMI is over 30 or 35, you've got to get just like a single. So you've got to just crack it up. The, the problem is, is the fat obviously dissipates the radiation. Um, the fat also actually protects it because it swells. But if you're a uh, you liver patient, it's really not good. So, we all know and we all hear about the risk of secondary malignancy. This is a review from Toronto. Chris Wallace um, looked at post-radiation therapy for prostate cancer. And what they found with median follow-up in about 12 years, hazard ratio for having a secondary malignancy, bladder cancer 1.67, colorectal cancer 1.79. So we know that there are risks of radiation to future malignancies. That's obviously with fairly high dose radiation therapy. Radiation effects can be divided into two categories, deterministic and stochastic. So deterministic effects are directly related to the exposure dose. The increasing dose increases your risk. And the main thing for deterministic effects is that there's a threshold level. So you hit a certain level and you're going to see an outcome. 
The severity is proportional to the exposure. Uh, examples of this, skin damage will happen at around 2 grays of exposure and cataracts at around 0.5 gray. Stochastic effects, on the other hand, are the ones that we're more concerned about as endourologists or urologists in general. There's no safe lower limit of exposure. The thought is that your severity is not related to your dose. The more radiation you get, the higher chance you have of getting a secondary malignancy, but it won't tell you how severe the outcome will be. Um, so malignancy is what we're concerned about here. So what do x-rays actually do? X-rays impact DNA so through two main mechanisms. One, they create free radicals by displacing electrons. Two, they ionize DNA directly. Most of this DNA damage gets repaired as it does every day uh, through various processes, though misrepair can lead to point mutations, translocations, and gene fusions, which are triggers or uh, starting points for malignant transformation. So, go back to 2007, there's a statistical modeling study that was published in the New England Journal uh, looking at CT scan use in the U.S. So, CT scans have obviously become sort of our main diagnostic tool. Most people don't leave the emergency department without getting a CT scan of some sort. And what they looked at was cancer risk, depending on what type of CT scan you got and how old you were at CT. And what they estimated was that around 1% to 2% of cancer that was caused in the U.S. was actually by CT scans alone. On the right side, you can see the lifetime attributable risk of having a CT scan. And the numbers are much higher, still low, but much higher the younger you are. So having a CT scan in a pediatric patient will have a far more significant outcome on their cancer risk than doing it in someone. And the numbers really drop off around the age of 35 and over. So after that, you can sort of scan away. Study two years later came out looking at similar data and what they, they use the same numbers, number of CT scans performed, radiation dose, and they estimate around 29,000 cancers would be caused by CT scans done in the U.S. in 2007 alone. So a fairly significant number just because of the volume of CT scans being performed. So this gets us to talk about radiation limits and radiation safety. Um, for us as endourologists, for people working with radiation, your dose limit per year maximum is 50 millisieverts, but over averaged over five years should be a maximum of 20 millisieverts per year. So when you look at background radiation in clear water of 7.88, they're already well over a third of the way to their average radiation limit. The other thing, and we'll talk about this a little later, is uh, the lens of the eye is sensitive to radiation, and so the doses are the same, or the limits are the same for the eye lens. For extremities, 500 millisieverts, um, your chance of getting a malignancy in your hands and your feet is quite low. Correct. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a minute. So, a study published in 2009 in the Journal of Urology looked at patients coming in for their first stone episode. This was done at UT Southwestern in Duke. Cumulative radiation was measured over one year, and what they found is that the mean exposure for people showing up first stone um, presentation, mean exposure was 29.7 millisieverts, so quite high. What was more concerning is that 20% of the patients were actually receiving over 50 millisieverts in that first year from CTKUBs, X-rays, fluoroscopy for ureteroscopy or PNLs, and CTIVPs. So even our patients are getting fairly high doses in general. In ureteroscopy alone, so another statistical modeling study, risk of malignancy from having a single left-sided ureteroscopy was estimated at 5.1 malignancies per 100,000 patients treated with ureteroscopy. So one out of every 20,000 people getting ureteroscopy could get a malignancy from that. More concerning, posterior skin, around one in a thousand people would get a malignancy from having a ureteroscopy. This is obviously because the x-ray beam is coming from below the patient during ureteroscopy, the typical CR. There are two main concerns by, that have been put forward in the literature from radiologists, interventional cardiologists, and neurologists. They're brain tumors and cataracts. 
So brain tumor risk. There's this report out there, and the people that publish this, the names are at the bottom. Um, they've now published three or four papers, and they're slowly accumulating data for brain tumors in interventional cardiologists and radiologists primarily. It's known that the dose to the left side of the head seems to be higher for interventional radiologists and cardiologists than to the right side of the head. And what they've found is that the people um, that they've tracked down who have brain tumors, um, their risk is much higher on the left side. So the brain tumors are almost always left-sided as opposed to right-sided. The concern being higher dose on the left side may be linked to um, brain cancer. High risk of bias in this is just a collection of individual case reports that they're putting together. This is a study with, I think, around 90,000 uh, radiation technologists from the U.S. trying to figure out if there's any um, significant increase in risk for different types of malignancies. <coughs> what they found was a small increase in risk in female breast cancer and melanoma. This is over about a 10-year period. Um, more concerning for brain cancer, they found a hazard ratio for mortality around 2.5 for people exposed to high doses of radiation over time. So the brain cancer risk, there's no definitive answer by any means, but there's definitely some data suggesting that there could be a link there. And then cataracts. So cataracts originally were thought to be purely deterministic. If you got two grays or more, or two sieverts of a dose, then you would form cataracts. Newer evidence is suggesting this may not be the case, and there may actually be um, either a reduced threshold or no threshold at all, and it may be a stochastic effect. Um, international guidelines used to be two sieverts or two grays as your deterministic dose, and now it's saying 0.5 sieverts. They've also dropped the yearly limit for people working with radiation from 150 millisieverts down to 20 millisieverts is what they determine as a safe dose for radiation to prevent cataract formation. Typical cataracts for people as they age form in the nucleus of the lens, but radiation doesn't affect the nucleus. Radiation affects specifically the posterior subcapsular region in the lens. This was a study looking at 100 interventional cardiologists versus 100 controls and what they found was that, and they all had ophthalmo ophthalmological exams, and they found the um, adjusted odds ratio for a cardiologist having posterior subcapsular lens defects was 3.85. Going along with the fact that radiation probably impacts this, um, the odds ratio was much lower at 2.2 for those cardiologists who wore lead glasses regularly, and we'll talk a little bit more about lead glasses in a few minutes. Another study looking at sort of general doses between different types of interventional procedures. Our patients overall don't get a very high dose of radiation when you compare them to people going in for IR procedures, neuroradiology procedures, or interventional cardiology procedures. But what was more concerning was that, and this is looking at 34 PCNLs compared to other um, procedures done in other fields, the dose to the radiologist or to the lens of the radiologist was actually much higher for us as urologists as opposed to these other specialties. And what it came down to was the use of protective gear, particularly a uh, ceiling mounted lead shield that often the radiologists or cardiologists are using. I think the fact that we are often closer to um, where the CON is, as opposed to the radiologist who's going in through the wrist, or the cardiologist who's going in through the groin or through the wrist and standing back a little bit further. For urology specific um, data, it's interesting because there's not a lot suggesting that we should be concerned. Uh, this is a study from just this year. Estimated dose per endourological procedure, ureteroscopy, PCNL, was around 20 microsieverts per procedure. They found that you need to do about a thousand procedures a year to actually reach your 20 microsievert limit. Another study, uh, sorry, <coughs> submitted last year, suggested that the dose to the eye for an endourologist performing around um, it's about 50 procedures per month, so 600 in a year, the dose would be less than one millisievert. Um, their fluoro time was much lower 
than in other studies. So obviously the dose per procedure is going to be significantly lower. A little bit higher was the resident who obviously stands at the front and does some of the procedure as well. That's why I know. <laughs> we learn these things now. Um, only one study has really brought into question the, the eye lens dose, and that was a study done out of Bulgaria using an over-the-table x-ray source, similar to what they have at St. Paul's. And they found that the annual eye lens dose for high-volume endourologists was around 29 millisieverts. So if you could continue that for your entire career, you're definitely over the recommended limits. It's a fixed table. I think it's about. I think it's about. Yeah, yeah and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit in a second. Pregnancy. No real concern to the fetus. Um, not a lot of publications on pregnancy and radiation, but one looking at 32 pregnant employees. Uh, they measured dosimetry values over the lead, under the lead, and there were no fetal doses above the recommended limits, and only two fetal doses were actually high enough to be picked up. So wearing adequate lead um, prevents any risk to the fetus. Now, wearing a lead apron can be a little cumbersome. There's a survey uh, done in Journal of Endurology. 64% of endurologists complain of at least one and uh, ortho orthopedic concern, whether it's neck or back pain primarily, um, the more cases they did, the higher chance they had of having um, this pain. Of the people surveyed, 97% were wearing lead aprons, 67% only were wearing thyroid shields, so a third of people not using adequate protection, and lead glasses were not used very commonly. But wearing lead aprons um, does have its side effects, though, obviously prevents you radiation exposure. So basic safety in the OR, we already talked about dose limits, 20 microsieverts, or sorry, 20 millisieverts per year is what we're aiming for. The goal in the OR, and you'll probably see this if you go through any uh, radiation <coughs> safety protocol, as low as reasonably achievable. So there are three main things to consider. How much time are you spending with your foot on the pedal? How far are you from the source? and what type of shielding are you using. Um, the C-arm position matters. As you move the x-ray beam closer to the patient, you can see as you move to the right on the image, the dose to the patient's skin goes up significantly. So you don't want to have your x-ray source too close to the patient's skin. But what you do want to do is bring your II, the image intensifier, down closer to the patient because it reduces scatter and prevents some of the radiation from getting out to um, the urologist and to other people in the room. Looking at the over table versus under table x-ray source, when you have your x-ray source right in front of your face instead of down below the table, it's going to impact the lens of your eye and other significant um, organs in the body more than if it's down under the table. There was one study uh, done with what they call phantoms or basically dummies that you can see there and they put little um, transducers on in the locations of each of the organs in the body and they measured all the effective dose of an under table source being the C-arm on the right versus an over table source. And what they found is the total body effective dose was nearly 10 times higher with the fixed table as opposed to the C-arm. So definitely something to consider when purchasing equipment. Other ways to reduce dose, you can use pulse fluoroscopy. So usually um, you have 30 pulses per one second or 30 frames per second in a typical fluoroscopy picture. Uh, you can drop that down to 15 to 12, and there are even some reports going down to 4. And obviously, if you have fewer pulses going out, you should have a lower dose, uh, dose reduction protocol. I had a study published a couple of years ago. They were able to drop their radiation exposure down by about 30% in PCNL. Another study looked um, on cadavers, and they found they dropped the dose by about 64% just by going to pulse fluoroscopy. This is a setting that you can change on the CRM itself. The next thing is to collimate. If you don't need to see the entire body, don't x-ray the entire body. Drop your image down. Um, simple study looking at single AP spine x-ray. They were able to drop the dose to around a third um, just by doing tight collimation 
around the spine. The effects were seen on all organs, not just the ones included in the field. So the scatter um, radiation matters as well. And then you have basic safety equipment. So things like the thyroid shield and the lead that we wear reduces the radiation dose by over 95% typically. So there are obvious things that we should be wearing. And then the other things that can be used, so you have on the right-hand side of the screen, you have the ceiling-mounted screen uh, that we don't use very much, but the radiologists seem to. Uh, you can get lead for under the table, so it protects the lower extremities from some of the scattered radiation, and then lead goggles as well. Lead gloves, um, they seem to make sense, but your hands are obviously in close to the field, especially with PCNL when you're trying to get access. Wearing lead gloves doesn't actually help. Uh, what happens is there are automatic dose adjusters in the CR machines. They adjust to keep the image quality at a certain level. And when you put dark objects in, they actually have to increase the dose of radiation in order to keep a good image. So you put the gloves on, you put your hands in there, your hands are protected, but the rest of your body and the patient are going to have higher doses. Same thing goes with having instruments in the field. Dark images or dark items that go into your screen or into your image will increase the overall dose. The final thing is a lead cap, and I'm waiting to see Dr. Patterson walking around with one of these. <laughs> Lead caps are similar to thyroid shields, similar to the lead that you wear on the rest of your body. They do reduce radiation exposure to the head, to the brain. Um, questionable, I think, in terms of their long-term benefits, but in some basic studies, they definitely reduce your exposure. Obviously, I have to mention lead is not um, a perfect thing. It can get damaged, so you have to take care of it. Lead can crack, it can fold, and when it does crack, it can actually create full cracks right through the lead that then exposes certain parts of the body to radiation. So everything should be hung up. When you put it down, you shouldn't be folding it over, you shouldn't be scrunching it up or stacking it on top of other leads. Um, and this should get checked by people in, I believe, biomedical engineering once a year is the minimum. And they actually take x-rays of the lead if there are any concerns to see whether they're reasonable to use. So what can we do to reduce risk? This is a study uh, that Dr. Chu and Moore are involved in looking at, it's so not just low dose CT, but ultra low dose CT. So they looked at 83 patients with a total of 230 stones coming in for S-Wall. And what they did was perform an abdominal radiograph as well as an ultra low dose CT and then looked at um, technical parameters around the two. The interesting thing to note, an ultra-low-dose CT actually has about half the dose of an abdominal radiograph. So CT scan with a dose of only 0.28 millisieverts, normal CT scan that you can see the conventional one, around six millisieverts. And what they found for the diagnostic performance is that ultra-low-dose CT outperformed a basic abdo x-ray um, in all parameters. Difficulties, you have to have access to a CT scanner and you also need a radiologist who's gonna read through these. Um, these were also patients coming in for s -well, so you knew that they had stones or the chance of them having stones was quite high. So it, I'm not sure if you guys have done anything in just first, first time stone. So you're talking about the stone? <coughs> So while we don't do it routinely in patients going through a uh, merge, um, if we ask for it, so if we know someone who's had something, we know we can ask for it. And 
home to it. And most of these were uh, cricket rights. They have the sound of the mind. And that uh, line that called it, you have to mess them. It's them. And so they're, 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 they're those. Um, even the American College of Acceptance and Advocacy. Another way to reduce radiation for patients coming in with renal colic would just be to not do a CT scan at all. So this is a New England Journal publication from 2014 looking at ultrasound as the primary diagnostic tool for patients showing up to eMERGE. There were three streams. One was ultrasound by an eMERGE doc, ultrasound in radiology, and CT scan. And this is just a regular CT scan. And what they found is that the radiation exposure was lower in the ultrasound group, so not negligent because um, in the point of care ultrasound group, 40% had a CT scan eventually, because the ultrasound wasn't diagnostic, and 27% in the radiological ultrasound had one. Um, but it did definitely reduce radiation exposure. The adverse events were no different between the group, and the length of stay in eMERGE was slightly longer to get an ultrasound done in radiology. I have a feeling that if we did it here, that length of time would increase significantly. And trying to get an ultrasound. This, this is down in the States. For PCNL, effective radiation dose around 4.2 millisieverts, so it's one of our higher um, radiation uh, procedures that we do. Increased dose in obese patients, as Dr. Chu was talking about earlier. Typical CT abdo around 8 millisieverts. The risk of lethal cancer from a CT scan is 1 in 2,000 or so, whereas your risk of dying from cancer is one in five. So on an individual basis, CT scan, PCNL, all these things probably, um, on an individual basis, probably don't matter. It takes your 400 in 2,000 risks and turns it into a 401 in 2,000 risks. But when you look on a population basis, the number of CT scans, PCNLs, ureteroscopies that we're doing, um, trying to reduce our radiation exposure is probably going to be helpful. Um, at Ohio State, their end urologist there is using a radiation reduction protocol, so going with pulse fluoroscopy, utilizing tactile feedback. So people are getting away from just putting their foot on the pedal and watching everything and getting into more of a sort of braille technique. And they reduced their average fluoro time, as was published, or presented mm -hmm. at AUA last year, dropped it down from four minutes to 65 seconds. When I was there in May, he said that they're probably going to get it down somewhere between 30 and 40 seconds <coughs> per patient for a typical PCNL. Other options, put a scope up first and use the scope to help guide where you're putting your needle in. So, <coughs> forced off a guided access, Dr. McDougall, I know, used this quite a bit when she was at UC Irvine. This is their standard technique. Uh, it allows direct visualization, reduces your fluoroscopy, and overall, you get similar outcomes to going in with direct fluoroscopy. A study out of North Carolina recently, air pyelogram. So going back to 1901 when, or 1903 when the first cystogram was done, it was done with air. Air shows up on x-ray lighter than contrast. So you put contrast in and you're automatically going to dose adjust up to increase your, um, your image quality. So by using air rather than contrast, you can reduce the dose. Um, they found no difference in fluoroscopy time. The radiation dose for a typical PNL drops from close to eight down to four and a half millisieverts per procedure. And it's all related to how the C on dose adjusts to keep the image quality um, up. Another option, you can go up with a scope and put a wire retrograde out the calyx. So 
you put your scope up, you find the calyx you want to exit from, and then you pass a semi-rigid wire that goes out through the body. And it saves you all that time of fussing around trying to get your access from an anti-grade approach. Um, the challenge with this procedure, and there are multiple challenges, if the wire goes the wrong direction, that's a problem because you can end up where you don't want to be. You can't get into the lower pole because the wire is quite stiff. And if there's a stone blocking the mandibulum, you obviously don't have access to it. The clear thing for PCNL for getting access would be to avoid fluoroscopy at all and just go to ultrasound guided access. Obviously, you can either reduce or eliminate radiation exposure. It also gives you visualization of surrounding structures, primarily bowel, spleen, liver, and the lung. Um, Worldwide, this is an endourological society survey. It's used, utilized about 10% of the time by itself, about 15% in combination with fluoroscopy. And the learning curve is only around 20 cases for an experienced urologist, so it doesn't take too long to figure it out. And your progression will improve over time. <clears throat> so what about in obese patients? The main concern with ultrasound is that um, your image quality degrades as the distance <coughs> increases. So this is out of UC San Diego. They looked at ultrasound alone versus using it in combination. They were able to get successful access in over three quarters of patients with ultrasound alone. For obese patients though, uh, so BMI over 30, that dropped down to just under 50% of patients. What they did find was that due to the increased radiation dose to obese patients, even using ultrasound to assist with access did drop the overall dose down significantly for obese patients. Stop that maybe there's a small cost savings due to reduced OR time, reduced capital costs, and no difference in stone free rates. They do it like us, retrograde catheter, and then they can put contrast up if need be, or put saline up to dilate it. <clears throat> this is a study I know the University of Washington is looking at this as well. What if we just do your ureoscopy your without fluoroscopy? So go up blind, just use scopes. Um, so they have a very specific protocol, the paper that was published back in 2015. They first of all go in with a semi-rigid ureteroscope, place a wire under direct vision. They measure how far up it is using the semi-rigid ureteroscope, how far up it is to the UPJ. And then they remember that for when they put their access sheath in, so they know how far to put their access sheath in. The sheath gets placed over a wire with tactile feedback only, no fluoroscopy, which to most of us would sound a little odd. And then if they come up against resistance, they perform the ureteroscopy to see what's going on. They treat the stone, and then they place a stent under direct vision through a cystoscope. Then they perform ultrasound intraoperatively to make sure that the upper coil is in a good position. So I'm not sure if we're quite ready for that, but there are at least a few centers looking at that. We have robots, so why not for stones as well? This is uh, called the Avicenna RoboFlex, as was presented in AUA last year. And it's a stone robot. So you put the scope in, then you hook the ureter scope up to the robot, and then you can go sit on the far side of the room with your coffee and your laptop and do your stone surgery. There, there was one case that they showed. It was a two centimeter stone. They did it in 74 minutes of total all our time with successful clearance. Another new technology coming out in this. So there's been a decline in uh, shockwave lithotripsy. So people are looking at any way possible to increase the efficacy of shockwave. And so researchers out of University of Washington have come up with burst wave lithotripsy. Burst wave lithotripsy being um, it's lower amplitude, higher frequency than S-wall. So it's not quite the big heavy shocks. It's rather just trying to fragment and stress the stone and break it from the outside. There's a picture on the right suggesting how um, it's supposed to work. Hasn't been done in humans yet, but Dr. Chu will be involved in the first 
uh, study, and I'm not sure how soon that will be opening up, but they've done a number of studies uh, in the lab so far. There's also ultrasonic propulsion, so the ability to actually move stones from one position to another in order to treat them or in order to aid in stone passage. And so the same people at the University of Washington have looked at combining these two technologies to get the stone into a good position, meaning usually out of the lower pole, and then break it down. This is one that I found <coughs> somewhat entertaining. So you have a bed, the bed moves, you have these um, oscillators that send out harmonic waves, and you basically shake or bounce the stone out of the lower pole. It would be the same as putting a person in Trendelenburg and pounding on their back. Um, but done under ultrasound guidance. Uh, a couple studies out of China looking at fragments smaller than four millimeters post ureteroscopy. Stone free rates were improved at two weeks and five weeks. And this is just a 20 minute procedure that's done not under anesthetic after they have their ureteroscopy or after they have shockwave lithotripsy done. So, another option hoping to prevent people from coming back to emerge with fragments, coming back and even further procedures and reducing their radiation risk. For large stones, rather than doing a big PCNL, why not just cut the patient open and take the stone out as a whole piece? So we have robots, so we might as well use them. So there was a study, 27 patients retrospective, looking at stones. I think average stone was about 2.8 centimeters for this. And they either performed pyelolithotomy or nephrolithotomy, um, and then reconstructed afterwards. Blood loss, very low OR time, not too bad and um, good outcomes overall, and the patients just end up with a small little extraction port site along with their regular robotic port sites. So another option, um, I don't know, Dr. Pius, if you can start doing this. I see shaking of head. Uh, AUA guidelines would say this shouldn't be your first line option, but is, is a possibility. So in conclusion, radiation is necessary in many areas of urology, there are definite potential risks, both for patients as well as for us as urologists. The goal is as low as reasonably achievable. There are lots of simple ways that you can reduce radiation exposure in the OR and lots of new techniques coming out uh, also targeted to reducing radiation risk. Thank you. Thanks to Dr. Chu, Dr. Patterson, Kamara, and Dr. Levine.